Thank you. Really great to be here with you today and to, to be talking about compassion. Thanks for, for the invitation. Knowing it was a uh, super Sunday, I've got my Superman socks on. Um, Michael tried to tell me I should wear shorts and t-shirt and thongs, but I decided, no, I'll, just, I'll, I'll bring my, my Superman socks and that'll, that'll do it. But as you can see, we are compassion. We are releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. That's what we're all about. Uh, and there would be marketing companies that would tell us, you need to lose that in Jesus' name bit. They say, you should actually just say releasing children from poverty and you'll get more kids sponsored. And we say, well, maybe that's so, but everything we do is in Jesus' name and we're not going to do that. It's all about Jesus. So I really thank you for the opportunity to be here. I, I thank you as a church for what you're already doing uh, through sponsoring children, through the, the donations that you make towards a child survival program that's helping mums and babies in the Philippines. And we're going to talk about some exciting opportunities that, that you might have to, to head off to the Philippines a little bit later. But I want to start by saying that this morning's message is rated PG. Now, that might be an odd thing to start with, but I say that not because I'm going to try and sensationalise anything or, or make you feel uncomfortable, uh, but today we're, we're talking, going to talk about poverty a little bit later. And as we know, poverty is messy. So I just say that to, to warn you, there are some things about poverty and the, the sorts of things that I'm going to share that are just a little disturbing at times, and, and we should. As, as people who follow Jesus, we should allow ourselves to be disturbed at times. That moves us on to, toward action. Uh, so as I say, I'm not going to try and sensationalise anything. You're not going to hear anything that you wouldn't normally hear on the, the 6 o'clock news, but let's face it, the 6 o'clock news is uh, pretty scary <laughs> these days. But my message today is asking you the question, what are you chasing? What is it that you're chasing in life? And I'll start off with a fairly controversial topic, and that is greyhound racing. Um, I don't know how many people here have ever seen greyhounds racing. I've never been to the track. It's not an interest of mine, but uh, something that is an interest of mine is seeing funny YouTube clips. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about one. No, I'm not going to show it to you. Sorry about that. Um, but... Greyhounds are trained right from the time that they're a little pup to chase after something called a lure or, or sometimes called a bunny. You see, the way that greyhounds race is that they're put into a box at the track and then the box opens and there's about eight dogs, I think, and they start running and on the inside of the track there's a motor and there's this fluffy thing attached to it and that's the lure or the bunny and that starts moving around the track. And as that moves around the track, all the dogs head off and chase it because they're taught from the time that they're puppies, this is what you do, this is what life's about. Your whole life is wrapped up in chasing after the lure, chasing the bunny down. And so they chase after it and they think, oh look, didn't catch it that time, I'll try again next time. And next time they're put in the box and... and they keep missing it, but that's what they're taught to do. That's what life is all about. And I wondered what would happen if the lure stopped, if they ever actually caught the lure. And this YouTube clip that I'm talking about, actually, we see this happen. It's at a, a greyhound track, and the, the box opens, and off go the dogs, and the lure is going around the track. But then what happens is the power goes out. And so the lure is, is running around the track and then the power goes out and it starts going more and more slowly until it eventually just stops. And I don't know what you might imagine would happen, but it's very interesting because a couple of the dogs go up to it and they go right up to the lure and they sort of poke their nose at it. And they look and they sort of, they look around at each other as if to say, I don't know what to do, do you? And there's, there's a couple of other dogs and the other dogs are off in the background, and they're just doing circles. They're, oh, I don't know. I, this has never happened before. We've never caught the lure before. And they're completely disoriented. They've got no idea what to do. And hopefully you can see similarities in life. That we are taught by the world to chase after certain things. We're told this is what life is really all about, and we go chasing after them with all our might. But let's look at the sorts of people that catch what the world tells us to catch. When we chase after what the world tells us to chase, it's those people who uh, have achieved fame and, and lots of money and, and all those sorts of things. And we look at Hollywood, it's reported in our, uh, in our news daily about what's going on and we see broken relationships, we see substance abuse, we see people who are 
who are dying way too early. This is all happening because these people have attained what the world tells us we should chase. The world says chase after these things. And these people put all their effort into chasing these sorts of things and eventually those who manage to get there find there's nothing in it. It's still not satisfying. There's nothing here. And if you're someone who is still chasing what the world tells you to chase because, hey, look, we've got to go after this, we've got to go after that, let me tell you that even if you do manage to catch the bunny, it will not bring any kind of satisfaction. And one of the things that we chase, we can chase after money or we can chase after something like fame or we can chase after love. And you recognise some of these things are not so bad. Or we chase after fitness, I'm not that guy. We chase after success, or, or we chase after influence, or we chase after power. And you'll notice that with a lot of these things, they're not so bad, but are they the things that we should be chasing after? So today I want to say, what is it that the scripture tells us, what is it that the Bible tells us, is what we should be chasing after? And so if you've got your Bible, you can follow along or follow along on the screen. Uh, and we're going to go to Matthew 6, 24 to 33. These are Jesus' words. He says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? In all your furious chasing, you're not going to add anything to your life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And there it is. What are we to chase? We're to chase after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, when you look at it, some of the things that are mentioned in that passage, there's things like clothes and, and food, Eating, drinking, wearing clothes, all fairly essential, you would think. But we're being told, don't chase after them. You see, there's a furious chasing after that uses all our energy. And we can be chasing after even good things. As we saw, some of those things that people chase after, some of them are good. It's good to, to seek love and, and to, to have influence in a good way. But if they're our primary focus, if they're the things that we're expending energy over, it's never going to bring satisfaction. But when we seek the kingdom of God and, and, and we seek after his righteousness, all these things are going to come along as well. These things will be added unto you. There's a difference between this furious chasing after and God supplying our needs. It's just like I mean, you, you've had a great series for those that have been here over the last little while, a great series on grace, where it's like, there's nothing we can do. When we chase after what the world chases after, that's what we're doing. We're saying, it, it all depends on me. I've got to make it right. I've got to be the right person. I've got to be this. I've got to be that. And Jesus here says, no, no, seek, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what you need to be seeking. And of course, if, if we're to seek after the kingdom, we need to know what that is. And Daniel mentioned the kingdom of God earlier, and we need to know what that is. And in Scripture, you'll see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven mentioned, and they both pretty much mean the same thing. Uh, we generally think of a, of a, a kingdom as a, a parcel of land, something which is ruled over. But that's not necessarily the full picture here if we're talking about a kingdom, because it's got more to do with the king than it has to do with the parcel of land. 
It's been described by uh, one theologian as God's people in God's place under God's rule. It's God's sovereignty over all. It's God in his place in our lives. And when that happens, there's none of this furious chasing. There's none of this seeking after this and then that and finding that it doesn't satisfy. It's actually seeking the kingdom and seeking to expand the kingdom. And it's not something that that we do. We just pursue. And, And of course, it's not wrong to pursue and chase if we're pursuing and chasing the right thing. Uh, which in this case, of course, is the the kingdom of God. So what does this kingdom look like? I want to take you to a passage in in Luke. And and this is an interesting passage because it's it's the place where it's recorded Jesus starting his ministry. He goes along to a synagogue and he's, he's given the scroll of Isaiah and he starts to read. And you would have to imagine that if this is at the start of Jesus' public ministry, then we better listen to it. Because if he's saying, hey, this is what the ministry is going to look like from here on in, this is what I'm about, we need to pay attention and say, okay, this is Jesus describing what his kingdom is about, let's have a look. And so in Luke 4, 16 uh, through to 21, we read this, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. They understood very much what he was saying. He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, of the the prophecies of, of Isaiah. He's saying, I'm it. But what's he saying he's about? He's about giving good news to the poor, he's freeing those who are oppressed, he's giving sight to the blind, all these things. He's saying, this is what I'm about. And if this is how he's setting up the start of his ministry, and this is what he's saying about himself, then surely that's what we need to be a part of as well. That's part of bringing this kingdom to this world. And there's this tension that we have of the kingdom that is to be in eternity and the kingdom that we live in right now. We can bring part of the kingdom here to this earth. I'm sure that many of you would have popped across the road at various times and gone off to the cinema and you sit there before your movie starts and while you're sitting there they run the trailers for the other movies that are currently coming out. And you sit there and and sometimes you sort of see a trailer and you think, yes, maybe I should have watched that movie instead of the one we're booked in to see. But you see just a few minutes of a movie and if the trailer has done its job, then you say, I want to see that movie. And we, as people who follow Jesus Christ, if we are living out the kingdom, then people will see our lives and say, wow, I want to live a life like that. We are trailers for the kingdom of God. We get to be a foretaste of of what's to come. We need to be bringing that to this world. Later in the same chapter, Jesus actually says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. So there it is again, the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. He's saying, that's what he's about. And of course, Jesus' coming is about reconciling and calling everything back to himself. And we often quote that that very famous verse in John 3.16. That's a big part of it. That God loved us so much that he sent his only son that... Whoever believes in him, you don't have to die anymore. You're not going to perish. You will have eternal life. That work on the cross and that resurrection is a big part of reconciling everything back to himself. We must never forget that. But sometimes we forget 1 John 3, 16, 17 and 18, where it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And if you're wondering, yeah, but surely when we're talking about this kingdom, it's actually talking about the coming kingdom in eternity. 
Well, when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us how to pray, one of the lines in the Lord's Prayer is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are never going to see the, the totality of, of God's kingdom as it should be lived out here on this earth. But again, we are like trailers in the movie theatre. We are a glimpse. We are to take some of that bright light into very dark corners. We are to be demonstrating God's kingdom across the world. So we need to ask, how much does our world look like this kingdom of God? If God's kingdom is all about God's sovereign rule and everything being reconciled back to himself through Jesus, how much does this world look like that? And I'd have to say, not a lot. One in six people live in extreme poverty in our world. 300 million children are going to go to bed hungry tonight. That's unacceptable. And there's a word I think that we as followers of Jesus need to, to reclaim, unacceptable. But there's a danger in that when we say that something is unacceptable because it, it leaves some of the responsibility to us to say, okay, well, we're going to actually take action to, to stop this. But this is unacceptable. If we are people of the way, if we are people that are, are foreshadowing the, the coming kingdom, this is unacceptable. 17,000 children are dying of preventable causes every day. This is children under the age of five. Now, get that word preventable because we've heard these statistics over so long, sometimes we forget what it actually means. Preventable means we can stop it. We have the resources. We've got the food, we've got the money, we've got the medicine, we could stop this. But as a world community, we're too focused on chasing what the world tells us to chase rather than chasing the kingdom. And because of that, 17,000 children are still dying every day under the age of five of preventable causes. Now, I still find hope here in that if you're sort of my age or older, you'd probably remember different figures. Because at one stage it was 38,000 children dying every day, and then it came down 22,000 children. And it kept coming down to, to 19,000 children a few years ago, and, and the most recent figures are those of, of 17,000 children. 17,000 children dying every day when we can stop it is still absolutely unacceptable. But we're going in the right direction. We can actually overcome extreme poverty. Don't believe the lie that some would have you believe that the problem is too big, we can't do anything about it. It's only too big if you and I refuse to act. And there are also around 30 million slaves around the world at the moment. That's everyone from those who are, who are growing coffee and, and chocolate for us. And I'm not saying stop that. I'm just saying be careful where you're buying stuff. Uh, to, to those who are working in sweatshops and many millions who are caught in sex trafficking. There are around 30 million slaves in this world at the moment. That, to me, does not look like the kingdom of God. That does not look like God's sovereign rule over all. But we, as followers of Jesus, are called to bring glimpses of that kingdom into this world. And I've seen that happen through compassion over many years. I've had the opportunity to, to visit a number of compassion centres. I first saw compassion at work in Haiti in Dominican Republic back in 2008 when I was still working in radio. I thought, yeah, I'm up for an adventure. They invited me to go. Yeah, OK, I'll go. And just wasn't prepared for, for what God was doing there. And that's why over a number of years I was drawn to work for compassion full time and started that uh, towards the end of uh, 2013. But I saw there just what compassion is doing. We're working to release children from spiritual, socio-emotional, physical and economic poverty in Jesus' name. I've now seen the work in Indonesia, uh, also in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Thailand, and, and earlier this year in the Philippines. And I see the way that the church is, is partnering with compassion. And earlier in the year when I was in the Philippines, I met Marites. Uh, you see her there. Her, her son is, is on the opposite side of the photo there. And a couple of the workers from the local church in the background. Now, Marites told us a little bit about her story. She told us that she used to run the illegal gambling in her area, the, the numbers game in her area, and she used to constantly argue because she lives in extreme poverty. We saw her home. It's just tiny. She actually used to argue constantly with her neighbours. She used to fight constantly with her husband. And she told us that she used to beat her children with coat hangers until the coat hangers broke across their bodies. Maritess was not a nice person to be around. And yet she told us she couldn't believe the difference that one person could make in her life. 
And in her life, that was her son, because when he was younger, he was registered with the local Compassion Project uh, at the local Wesleyan Church. So she thought, oh, I better go along and check this out. What are they on about? Maybe she was trying to recruit some more people to, to gamble or something, I don't know. But she went along and, and God just grabbed hold of her heart and completely transformed her and her husband and the other children in the family through one child being registered with compassion. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a will that is strong enough to turn my life around in any major way. We can be in, in such a place where we realise that we need to make change. And for Marites, she could look at her life as it was and say, my life's a mess, I need to be a better person and try and change it around. But turning over a new leaf isn't going to last any length of time. This transformation happened for her some time ago and, and for the last three years she's been the, the treasurer for the women's ministry in her church. She runs a local Bible study. Everyone loves her. That's a lasting change that comes only from a transformation of Jesus Christ entering her life and her family's life, of the Holy Spirit working within that family. I just love seeing that, a whole family transformed because one child had been registered through compassion. Also, while I was in the Philippines, I, I got to meet China. There she is. She's one of the kids that our family sponsors. Uh, she's there with her mum, Christita. It was great to actually meet her and to, to, uh, to actually see what our sponsorship is doing. You see, we sponsor Christita, uh, uh, China through Compassion because it's, it's Christ-centred, as I mentioned before. It's all about Jesus. And we want her to know about Jesus. It's child focused. That means that China will always have an understanding that she's known, loved, and protected because of the local compassion center. And we are church based. And the thing I love about that is that China gets to go along to, to the local church to hear the gospel. When I visit projects around the world, I don't see a big sign saying compassion because we're not there to lift up the name of compassion. We're there to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. So when I go to compassion centers, I see the local church sign. It's the local group of Jesus followers, the local Christians, the local church who is actually doing the work. And we do that because we honestly believe that God grows his kingdom through the local church. I loved hearing what Daniel was saying about how you are growing the kingdom in this area through this local church. And that's exactly what we're doing in the Philippines at, at the church where, where China is. We actually have that opportunity to see the kingdom grow through the local church. And we are distinctly church-based. You know, I am convinced that the most loving thing that I have ever done for, for my two children is to introduce them to Jesus. It gave me great joy on, on two different occasions to, to baptise each one of them. And to know that they're, they're getting to know the Lord. And I want the same for China. But of course, I wouldn't be much of a father if all I did was to, to, to tell them about Jesus and then not give them that practical experience of, of what it's like to, to be loved, to, to put food on the table for them, to make sure that my kids have a home, to make sure that, that someone's there for them. I want my kids to understand that they're known, loved and protected and I want China to know that as well and that's why we sponsor Through Compassion. A few bits and pieces about Compassion. We've been operating for, for well over 60 years now, started in 1952, at the moment assisting around 1.8 million children, working through around 7,000 churches in 26 different nations. <coughs> and this is the bit that always gets me. Each year between 120,000 and 150,000 children respond to the gospel, say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, because they've seen Jesus' love in action. They've seen glimpses of the kingdom. The workers at the local church who are partnering with Compassion are there demonstrating the kingdom. They're trailers for the coming kingdom. And so they're seeing that. And if it's a little hard for you to get your head around this figure of 120,000 to 150,000, try and get your head around this. That means that today around 400 children in churches partnering with Compassion are going to give their lives to Jesus. 
That will happen today around 400 children. And not because it's Sunday, because it's any other day. That will happen again tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. As we work with those children and help them come to an understanding of who Jesus is and who they are. And that's why we sponsor China through Compassion. But of course I can tell you all these things because I work for Compassion. And you might say, well, yeah, he's paid to say nice things. But there are some people that are not paid to say nice things about us. Uh, some independent researchers actually looked at Compassion's project, uh, projects in, in various places in the world a few years back. And they came up with some amazing statistics, uh, such as the fact that kids who have been through a Compassion project uh, at the local church are more likely, 30 to 75% more likely, to be leaders in their community. And I love this. They're between 40 and 75% more likely to be leaders in their local church. We're actually raising up leaders who love Jesus. And there's lots of other figures too, and I can talk to you about those afterwards if you'd like, but it works. It's, it's just so good to know that it absolutely works. What I want to do now, because I've, I've told you lots of stories, um, I want you to hear from someone who has benefited from compassion and is continuing to benefit from compassion. I want you to hear her tell her own story, and then I'll wrap things up. So we're going to see a video now. This is Eunice. We moved to this place after my father lost his job. I live here with my family, my mom and dad, and all my brothers. I am the only daughter. Our home is built over a very dirty river. And when the storms happen, our home floods with water and garbage. This is a scary place when it gets dark. People get drunk and fight all the time. Even though I live in this place, I have been sponsored by Arlie and Nancy. I call them mom and dad. Mom and dad. Although we are countries apart, I know they chose me. They tell me, Eunice, we remember you. We love you. You are like our own daughter. Because of my sponsors, I had the opportunity to go to the Compassion program at the church in my neighborhood. For all these years, my sponsors and my church have helped me to receive better food and medicine. With the help of my sponsors, I will be able to work to help my own family. When I was nine, my compassion teacher shared Jesus with us, and that's when I accepted Christ. Even though I am poor, He has provided my church. He gave me sponsors who love me. God will never leave us. I want to share everything I have learned with kids who are like me. I want them to feel the joy of having a sponsor, to get a letter that says, I love you, you are special to me. With the help of our sponsors, we can grow up and finish our studies and learn how to live our faith in Jesus. I want to serve the Lord and I won't stop serving Him because He does not stop loving me. There are children around the world waiting, waiting for a sponsor like you. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. So you see, we come back to, to the initial question of, what are you chasing? Are you continuing to chase what the world tells you to chase? And, and it's easy, even for those of us who are followers of Jesus, to slip into that, to start following things that are good, but they're not the best. Are you chasing the kingdom? That's not just about sponsoring a child through compassion. That's through everything you're doing in this local church, in spreading the kingdom in this local area. It's what you do when you're at work each day. It's being that trailer for the coming kingdom to, to those people around you, to family members who, who don't yet know Jesus. Are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Or are you still anxious about what you'll wear or what you'll eat? God's got it covered. 
Don't worry about those things. Just relentlessly chase him. And as for compassion, I read a quote some time back and it says, you say you care about the poor, then tell me what are their names. Do you know the names of the poor? Because a name is more than just a tag that we go by. Our name represents who we are and part of our journey. When someone bothers to get to know your name, they get to know a bit of your story, you can grow close. And I'd invite you to get to know the name of a child living in poverty. On the table out the back, there are a number of child sponsorship forms. And what I'd like you to do is to head out there. There's a number of children that are available for sponsorship in the area in the Philippines where The Rocks is partnering. So if you want to be a part of that partnership, you're able to, to sign up today. So you can fill out the form that's out there. Uh, there are a number of people that will be at the desk. They're our volunteer advocates have come along today and they'll show you how to fill out the form. Then we take one part of the form home and you take the photo home, stick it on your fridge and start praying for that child, knowing that further down the track, they're going to hear about Jesus and have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And great news. You might even get to visit them because next year in September, the Rocks Church is going on a trip to the Philippines. So if you sponsor a child in that area where, where the Rocks is partnering or you're going to today, you have the opportunity. We'll give you more details in the coming weeks once we have some basic prices and some ideas. Uh, but mark that in your diary now. September next year, that is going to be fantastic. Actually seeing what's happening on the ground and seeing some of those children who are being brought to new life in Jesus through compassion. So we want you to be a part of that. But I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. As I say, there are a number of children from that particular region that are available for sponsorship. If we run out of those kids, then we have some forms that you can fill out. But ask the people on the desk, they'll be able to give you those details. But I'd love to see all those children sponsored today as part of growing the kingdom, chasing after the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that when we chase you, when we seek your kingdom first and foremost, that everything else follows, everything else falls into line and, and there's no longer the striving. There's no longer that, that relentless chasing what the world chases where we just come up empty time and time again. But when we chase you, we get to rest in you. And so we would ask that that would be what we commit to do today. Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't yet know you, but is striving to, to do what the world asks, that they would just give that away today and that they would follow you. I pray for those of us who are already following you, Lord, that if we have just got off track and we're seeking good things, but not the best, that you would realign us back to seeking first the kingdom of God, your righteousness. And Lord, I would pray wholeheartedly that many children today would be released from poverty in Jesus' name because you would touch hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit to make a difference in the life of one child. And Lord, for those families who are already sponsoring, I pray that you would touch their hearts and, and ask them to consider whether there's room for one more. Lord, we want to see this world shine brightly. We want to see your sovereign rule over all. Would you work in our hearts today? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a hand to Rodney one more time. That was very inspiring. I, I catch the end bit of that message, and I'm telling you, um, there's no better feeling than knowing that your few dollars actually do make an impact in a, in a child's life. We started with one and then uh, we grew to two and we thought, okay, two is about the max that we can handle with all the expenses and the, the commitment that we already made to the church and everything. And then when I came back from Haiti last year, uh, Jaden asked us, can we sponsor one more dad? And, and that's when we, we went from two to three. So I'm telling you, it's a fantastic uh, experience. When I went uh, to Haiti last year, I saw firsthand how compassion actually works and i'm telling you they are the rock star in what they do you cannot impact 
more children with your dollar than what compassion can do uh, with your money. I'm telling you, they're so efficient. They're one of the most efficient NGOs in the world. So most of your dollars actually go to the children instead of going to administration and, and uh, marketing and all the other expenses. So you know that your dollar goes further when you give it to compassion. And they work. That's just simply work. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of children in Haiti. Uh, were really, really blessed by, by compassion being there. And they're changing the country. They're not just changing their family. A lot of them grew up to become leaders for their country, where all their leaders actually left for the U.S. to live the better life. A lot of the compassion kids who grew up uh, through the leadership program actually stayed, become uh, doctors and nurses, help in the government. I'm telling you, your money goes far when you give it to compassion. All right? So do uh, consider. Uh, visit the, the table at the back. And, um, and God will really, really bless you through this uh, journey with compassion. All right. Um, I want you to stand up right now as we end our worship experience today. Uh, thank you again if you are a guest for coming. Don't go home right away. We have new guest lounge uh, on my right to your left. Uh, we love to catch up with you. We love to get to know you. And you can get to know us a little bit better as well. We have free coffee. Don't go home right away. Free coffee for everybody and biscuits and all that. Uh, and if you need prayer, uh, our prayer leaders will be uh, right here in a few seconds. Uh, please, you know, you don't have to fight the battle alone. They would love to pray for you. They would love to pray with you and intercede on your behalf. Uh, please, uh, share your story. Everything is going to be confidential, but it's good to have someone to walk alongside you in your journey together. All right? So let us pray as we uh, be dismissed from this place. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always wherever you go. May you give up the good for the better, even the best, as you invest for eternity in the kingdom of God through sponsoring children, through giving in the local church. May God bless your study. May God bless your ministry. May God bless your work, your family, your children, their relationships, everything that they do. May God be magnified through your lives right now, until Jesus Christ comes again, even forevermore. And all God's children who are blessed, stay together with me today. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful week.